Good morning. If you have a Bible, open it up to the book of Isaiah, chapter 49. If you don't have a Bible, uh, slip up your hand and Pastor Dave will get a Bible into that hand so you can follow along with our continuing study uh, through the book of Isaiah, which is our continuing study of all of the books of the Bible. It's been... uh, it's been a, a wonderful journey to walk through the Scriptures together with you and others over the last uh, 11 years uh, here in Calvary Chapel. When uh, Pastor James left, um, called back to his hometown, uh, he had just finished up uh, the Gospel of Mark, and so I jumped into Luke, and we've plowed through Luke, through Revelation, and then took the turn, went back to Genesis, and now here we are in Isaiah. So uh, we ought to be up to about Luke in another two or three years. Not in any hurry, but wanting to get through the Word and and, uh, understand what it says. Isaiah chapter 49 is where we are. I have to say that um, this is an interesting week. Yesterday, uh, our gospel choir uh, gave our fall um, concert of ministry in East Liberty Presbyterian Church, which is, if you've ever been in East Liberty, is a huge cathedral of a building. It's it's quite large and it's quite majestic and and beautiful. Uh, Back in the uh, early days, it was funded primarily by Andrew Mellon who was not known to be all that uh, wonderful and expressive of a Christian man, evidently. My mother told me that uh, the church was known as Mellon's Fire Escape, meaning he had uh, funded the church to avoid the flames of hell, uh, thinking maybe some philanthropy could help. I don't stand in judgment of him. I hope that he repented if he was had not already and that we will see him uh, with our Lord when we get there but uh, it's quite a majestic place and it and and it was full I don't know how many the the place holds I don't know do you know Carol how how many it holds I would think it's a thousand maybe even 1200 or something and it's in a typical cathedral seating arrangement which if you've ever noticed is in the shape of the cross very long uh, area straight out and then two short wings up towards the front in the shape of a cross and uh, it was pretty full and I got to tell you in all the years of the of the gospel choir that we've been singing we go to uh, little churches we've gone to some nursing homes we've gone to various other things where um, the uh, uh, the spirit of God is uh, people are freer and we can uh, it, it's a uh, uh, predominantly uh, African American choir, and uh, it's gospel music, and so it it gets lively, and and especially within you know the smaller churches which are expecting a lively worship time, uh, it you know it is. In the fall, large concert in this majestic you know Presbyterian church. In the past few years, it's actually been kind of reserved, a little more formal and so forth. But yesterday, the Spirit of God was heavy in that place. It was just it was just an amazing time and people standing up and shouting hallelujah. And um, I don't know how often that happens within the traditional uh, services of that church, but it was it was a wonderful time of ministry. And this week, we head towards Thanksgiving. And as we've already done, remembering to give thanks. And a couple in the choir, uh, the um, Jim and Rita Carr, Rita, Rita's mom went home to be with the Lord two days ago. Went home to be with the Lord. And she went home then. Pastor Dave's mom went home to be with the Lord Thursday and is in His presence. And... 
uh, I'm remembering that it was one year ago this Wednesday that my mom went home to be with the Lord. And I was thinking about that and thinking about that in the, in, in the context of thanksgiving. And also in the context of this time of year, which is the harvest time. And it struck me that in, that in, that in some sense... You know, to, to go home to be with the Lord during the harvest time is the Lord uh, gathering in His harvest for the year to bring in the fruits of His labor in His people. There's a scripture passage that, that sounds a little odd unless you know the Lord. And uh, I, I'll probably paraphrase it slightly here. It says, uh, blessed in the eyes of the Lord is the death of His saints. Something very close to that. And it's an interesting thing to say, isn't it? But it says something about our Lord Jesus Christ and about this life. I love what Pastor Dave said. His mom left her earth suit here. And she's gone on to glory and has been changed from the incorruptible, from the corruptible into the incorruptible, from the immortal, from the mortal into the immortal. And so for her right now, and for Rita Carr's mom, and for my mom, and there are others I'm sure here who have lost loved ones who are with the Lord there is that knowledge that they are face to face with their Creator and that there is no more sickness. There is no more sorrow. Death was just a walking from this life into the next. We think about those things at times when someone has passed. But we need to remember that in all of our days. We need to remember that every moment of every day. I think that's a little bit of what Paul meant when he said, I carry around in myself the death of Christ. I know there was much more of that, but as we remember the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know we have a hope and a place where we are headed. And those who have gone before, we, it becomes more real when we know someone who we have seen face to face. And now we know they're there. It becomes, becomes a little more real. I'd encourage you to remember in each and every day of your life, it is real. And whether you have known someone who has gone before you already or not, to know and remember and ask the Lord to center it into your being, that knowledge that we are just aliens. We're not citizens of this world. We're citizens of another kingdom that is not of this world. Jesus told Pilate, my kingdom's not of this world. If it was, hey, you wouldn't have a chance, buddy. But this is being done in order that His kingdom would be established through the death and resurrection of our Lord, which has happened. And He has gone on and He is seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on yours and my behalf every single moment, preparing a place for us so that when we make that step from this life into the next, We will go knowing someone there. Not just your mom or your dad or brother or sister or friend or grandma or grandpa. But we will know the one in charge. We will know the king. I love the story in the book of Acts where Stephen, the first witness unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who was murdered, executed because of his faith. As he was dying, he said he could see Jesus standing beside the throne. 
The scripture says he's seated. It's as if he stood to receive Stephen into heaven. A wonderful image because it says what the Lord, what he will do when we arrive. He's not going to be there and go, all right, well, let's see. Which one are you? Oh, let's see. Malin. I've had a few of those. Okay. Kevin? Okay. What century were you in? Okay, right. Well, let's see. Hmm. Didn't score well on that part of the test. No. No. He knows me. He knows you. You are his child. I wouldn't do that to my son or daughter. When they returned back home, after us being separated for a long period? No. He will be just like the parable he told of the father seeing his son coming from afar who runs and throws his arms around and says, Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. That's what we have to look forward to. That's where we are going. Let that be a comfort Let that be a strength to your walk in this life. Let's pray. Father, we thank You so much for the truth of Your Word, the truth of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, that good news that tells us that this world is not our home, but we are aliens here. We are pilgrims. We are on a journey through this wilderness. But our home is with You. And whether it is later today or whether it is decades from now that we arrive home, that's where we are headed. Lord, I pray that You would make this alive in our hearts once again, that it might be a strength that it might give us courage in the midst of facing adversity here in not only an alien kingdom, but a kingdom that is in many ways in opposition and at warfare with the kingdom that we are citizens of. Lord, let it give us strength and hope. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Isaiah chapter 49. It really, uh, that wasn't an introduction to the message. That really was just uh, an extra message this morning. This morning you got two. The short one and now here comes the longer one. Okay. The mystery revealed. In this chapter, chapter 49, we begin and we will continue on. We've seen one already. But Scriptural scholars call this one of the songs of the servant. The servant songs. Because now through the next seven or eight chapters, we will hear the songs of the servant of the Lord. Who is the servant of the Lord? It is Jesus. It is Jesus. Here we see pictures painted hundreds of years before Jesus walked the earth about him and about what his ministry would be. And he's referred to as the servant. And he's referred to in several different ways. Now, this passage of Scripture, we can get lost in it a little bit if we don't understand the characters and think about who's speaking at any one time. The Scripture gives us who it is, but we need to remember who it is who is speaking. Sometimes it is the Lord God, Yahweh, God the Father. At some times it is the Lord's servant, Jesus. At other times it is Israel or Zion. And as we walk through here, I'll point them out to you. So let's begin at chapter 1 of cha- or verse 1 of chapter 49. Listen O coastlands to me and take heed you peoples from afar. The Lord has called me from the womb. 
From the matrix of my mother, he has made mention of my name. And he has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. And made me a polished shaft. In his quiver, he has hidden me. And he said to me, you are my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. And then I said, I've labored in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and in vain. Yet surely my just reward is with the Lord and my work with my God. And now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him so that Israel is gathered to him, For I shall be glorious in the eyes of the Lord, and my God shall be my strength. Indeed, he says, it's too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel, their Holy One, to him who man despises, to him whom the nation abhors, to the servant of rulers. Kings shall see and arise. Princes also shall worship because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel. And he has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you. I will preserve you and give you as a covenant to the people, to restore the earth, to cause them to inherit the desolate heritages, that you may say to the prisoners, Go forth to those who are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed along the roads, and their pastures shall be on all desolate heights. They shall neither hunger nor thirst, neither heat nor sun shall strike them. For he who has mercy on them will lead them. Even by the springs of water, he will guide them. I will make each of my mountains a road, and my highway shall be elevated. Surely these shall come from afar. Look, those from the north and the west and from the land of Sinim. Sing, O heavens. Be joyful, O earth. Break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. We'll stop right here. He begins this passage of Scripture speaking of the servant as a hidden weapon of power. A hidden weapon of power. Look at it there in the first verse. I'm sorry, the second verse. He says, He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he has hidden me. Now, depending upon the Uh, translation of the scripture you are looking at, some of those pronouns, me, are capitalized. Now let me tell you something. In the Hebrew language, the ancient Hebrew language, there were not capitals, there were not smaller case. That's why in some translations it doesn't capitalize it. But it's trying, the scholars, the interpreters are trying to help us understand, just like I said, who is speaking and who is this referring to? Okay? Speaking about the servant of the Lord, Jesus. So, it begins in chapter 49, verse 1. Listen, O coastlands, to me. This is the servant of the Lord speaking right here. This is Jesus, the Messiah of Israel, saying, Hey, coastlands, listen to me. You who are afar off, all around, listen, throughout all the region, throughout all the world, listen to me. The Lord has called me from the womb and from the matrix of my mother. Now, that word today, matrix, immediately what might have jumped into your mind is someone in slow motion going like this, and suddenly, right? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not that matrix, okay? The word, the Hebrew word literally there means bowels, which isn't exactly wonderfully poetic to say from the 
bowels of my mother, he has made mention of my name. But the use of that Hebrew word for bowels is a little bit like the way we use the word gut. You know, I just felt that in my gut. And we don't really mean usually in my gut unless we're telling someone how we were sick the week before. Yeah, my gut really hurt. But when we say, I just, I don't know, I felt it in my gut that this was the right thing to do. Saying from the innermost being, okay? So that's, I don't know where they came up with the word matrix. It's kind of a strange word to use right there. But the idea is, he is saying, hey, from my mother's womb, from from the depths of my mother, speaking in his human experience, from the moment of conception by the Holy Spirit, the Lord had established Jesus as Messiah. Now, that's an important theological principle. Some will teach Jesus didn't know what his mission was and didn't have self-recognition of who he was until he was baptized. And the Holy Spirit came upon him and then suddenly he went, Whoa, I'm the Messiah. I'm going to save Israel. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the pre-existent Christ had consciousness and awareness. And that, as it says in the book of Philippians, he didn't consider his godly nature to be something to grasp hold of and say, I'm not going down there and doing that. But he humbled himself, became obedient, learned obedience. God learned something? Yes, in an experiential way. Who was God obedient to? Did you ever think about that? So Jesus learned obedience. Jesus, as God, the God-man, learned obedience by humbling Himself and becoming a man and taking on the form of a servant and humbling Himself unto death. Interesting theological stuff. But the point here is that from the beginning... Jesus is the plan. Jesus was not plan B. God didn't go, man, I thought that Adam and Eve would do better in the garden. What am I going to do now? No. God knew when He created Adam, when He created Eve, that He would redeem mankind by giving Jesus. Wow, that speaks so much to my heart about the heart of God. Would I create the human race knowing they would reject me, knowing that I would give the most precious thing in order to establish a relationship whereby we can fellowship together? Would I do that? I'm not that nice. But God has that kind of love. Wow. Wow. And in verse 2, Jesus describes himself as he has made, he who? God has made my mouth like a sharp sword. The picture in the book of Revelation is the image of Jesus Christ with a sharp two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Jesus is called the Word of God in Hebrews 4.13, I think it is. It says, the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, able to divide between soul and spirit, bone and marrow. That's Jesus. And in the shadow of His hand, He has hidden me. He's made me like a polished shaft. In His quiver, He has hidden me. Now the imagery here, obviously, is, is of warfare, a sword. An arrow in his quiver. The interesting thing is it says, he's hidden me. And that's exactly what God did. You see, Jesus was the is God's powerful weapon in the warfare between good and evil. He's the one above it all. He is the way we overcome evil. Jesus was hidden from the eyes of 
the people of this time. Certainly there were prophecies and promises and so forth, but they didn't understand. And we can't on this side of Calvary say, why in the world couldn't you figure this out? We probably wouldn't have either. Some knew, but as it was divinely revealed, as they drew close enough to the Lord to allow the Lord God Almighty to reveal it to him. But you see, Paul understood this idea. And so I'm going to read some scripture passages to you. If you are quick in the scriptures, you might be able to find your way there. But if you want to just wait and jot down the the biblical references and look at them later, here we go. Romans chapter 16, verses 25 and 26. Paul says this. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, here it comes, according to the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but now made manifest and by the prophetic scriptures made known to all nations. And it goes on because the context is is speaking about something else, but in this blessing, he uses this idea of the preaching of Jesus, the gospel, the revelation of a mystery kept secret since the world began. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 through 10. It says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they wouldn't have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, quoting from the Old Testament, I has not seen nor, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through His Spirit. This is an interesting passage because I get it quoted to me a lot of times when people say, well, I'm really praying, but I I really don't know what the Lord's going to do here. And you know, like the Scripture says, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love Him. And I always say, Go back to the scripture and read the the, the little verse right after that, because it says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit. God has shown us where we're going. God has spoken what will happen. He's demonstrated it through the person of Jesus Christ so that we know we have seen what happened to Jesus, his disciples and many others saw him die by Roman executioners who were experts at executing. He was dead. He didn't swoon. He didn't fall asleep. He wasn't given an anesthetic that made him look dead so that he could sneak out of the grave later. He was dead, dead. And they saw him alive. And even those who had heard it for three years that this was going to happen at first didn't understand it. You remember? When Mary came and said, I've seen the Lord, it says they all looked at her like she was crazy. She's a hysterical Hebrew woman. Come on. I know you're really emotional right now, okay? But then Peter and John had enough in their hearts to go to the grave and check it out. Okay, well, let's, you know, let's go see if the body's there. And they got there and the, the stone is rolled away. And John, who was the younger and proved that he was younger by running ahead of Peter and getting there first, didn't have the gumption to step into the t- grave, into the tomb, into the cave, but waited till Peter came. <laughs> and then he stepped in. And then John did. The scripture says they saw that the Lord was not there and this wasn't a grave that had been robbed. This is someone who left on their own volition the grave. And the angels who said, what are you guys doing here? Why do you seek the living among the dead? This is a cemetery. 
You're not going to find a dead person. You're not going to find a living person here amongst the dead. He's risen, just like he told you. Right? We have seen and we have heard testimony of where we are going. It has been revealed to us. The gospel, the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom ordained by God before the ages began, but now made manifest. Here comes another one. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 9. Ephesians 1, 9. Paul says, Having made known to us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, He might gather together in one all things in Christ. Hmm. Just a little later in the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, he gives a little bit more understanding of what this means. Gathering all together in Christ, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly already written, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which getting back to that revelation of the mystery, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to His holy apostles and prophets. And what is it? Here it comes, verse 6. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of His promise in Christ through the gospel, making all one in Christ. In the first three or four chapters of the book of Ephesians, Paul deals with this, which was a struggle in the church. And we don't have the same appreciation of that struggle today. And that is, Jesus was a Jew. Nearly all of his followers were Jews. When a Phoenician woman came to Jesus seeking a miracle, he said, why should I give the food of the sons of the kingdom to the dogs? Did Jesus just call her a dog? Yeah, he did. He called her what the people of his day called Gentiles. Separate. You're not part of the kingdom of God. You're separated from the kingdom of God. We are the ones who have been given the law. We are the ones who have a relationship. We've been chosen by God. Now, you could look back once again anachronistically and say, well, gosh, they sure got full of pride. God told them to separate themselves. God instructed them to separate Come out from among them. Don't marry Gentiles. Marry within the kingdom. Don't be like them. Don't follow them in any of your ways. Don't even eat the same kind of food they eat. Eat kosher. God was teaching the idea of separation. And in their sinful way, just like if it had been the Gentiles chosen and the Jews not, what we would have done, we had a, they had a tough time with it. Well, how much separation? Okay, we'll go way over here, we'll, but wait, you know, you're not supposed to be. Okay, well we'll, 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 we'll mix with them. Well, we'll, And they vacillated back and forth and didn't fully understand. But God had told them to be separate. But God's plan from the beginning was that God would redeem mankind through the Jews, through one Jew in particular. Jesus, Yeshua of Nazareth. He is the one who would save the world. And the early church struggled with this. Well, first they preached at the temple. They, te they taught other Jews. And just like the Jews of that day, they began to think, okay, well, I guess a Gentile could come in, but... You know, they've got to be proselytized. They've got to be circumcised. They've got to start eating kosher. They've got to take this on. And God gave the revelation primarily through Paul, but not exclusively through him. No, actually, all that law stuff is for the Jews. And it was a picture of what God would do through Christ. But Gentiles don't have to be circumcised or eat kosher. 
And it was a struggle for the church. And, you know, we got through it. But that's what the book of Ephesians speaks about in the first couple chapters. It uses this imagery about there used to be a balustrade, a short railing that separated the court of the Gentiles from the inner parts of the temple area outside the holy places of the temple. And there were signs that were posted there in Paul's days that said something along the lines of, if you're not circumcised and you cross this line, you will be responsible for your own death. Okay. I've seen do not enter signs, but I've never seen one about, you know, that extreme. And they meant it. If you remember the the riot that happened when Paul was in Jerusalem and when he got arrested and ended up being... uh, uh, saved, actually arrested by the Jews, then saved by the Romans, and then ends up in Rome in the latter parts of the book of Acts. The whole thing that the Jews said was, he let an uncircumcised guy cross the line. He brought him into the temple. That was the issue at hand that caused, they were able to cause a whole riot there. So much so that the Romans had to step in and go, whoa, okay. That's how much they meant it. That's how deeply they felt this, that this was how God expected them to behave. And now God says, the dividing line between Jew and Gentile has been taken away in Christ. And now he has made one new man out of all. Jew, Gentile, slave, free, male, female. Israeli, Palestinian, white, black, yellow, gold, American, Iraqi. It doesn't matter. The only way to the Father is through the person of Jesus Christ. That's it. And in fact, that was true before the cross too. It was just a full understanding and revelation of what it meant to have faith in God. It wasn't there on this side of Calvary. It's here. The mystery has been revealed. God has broken down the dividing wall. One more. Colossians chapter 1, verse 26. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. To them God willed to make known what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. For a Jew of Jews, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, like Paul of Tarsus, to say, the Messiah in you, Gentiles, the hope of glory. It's amazing. It's amazing. We can't appreciate what that is. Jesus has come to save all. And though it might not be according to our understanding of how the mystery of God's saving us has come to us, we sometimes do the same thing. We divide. Oh, well, they're Presbyterians. Oh, well, they're Catholics. Oh, well, they're this. Oh, they're that. Now listen carefully to me. Very carefully. God has come so that there would not be those divisions. There would only be one division because Jesus said, don't think I came to bring peace on this earth. I came to bring a sword that's going to divide between family members. What's that division? You are in Christ or you are not in Christ. That's the division. That's the only division. That's the only division there's allowed to be. And when we as human beings begin to divide up the kingdom into this and that and that, and well, well, we're not walking the way Christ has called us to. Now, we are called to be faithful to what the Scripture teaches. Absolutely. And we want to be careful to know what it says so we apply it correctly. And we should be lovingly passionate 
with our brothers and sisters in the Lord in places where we disagree about the Scripture because we want as a family to be right before our Father. Be careful. Be careful about becoming the judge. There is one judge. Be careful about where you make those divisions. We call ourselves as Calvary Chapel non-denominational. Denomination actually comes from the, the root word nom to be named, taking on a name. Oh, well, we are Calvary Chapel. We're not this. Or we're Calvary Chapel, which immediately separates. Well, you're not Calvary Chapel if you don't come to Calvary Chapel. And that's not the idea. And, and in our statement of faith, we say we are non-denominational, not that we are anti-denominational. We're not against denominations, but against the division that denomination brings. And so I have friends and brothers and sisters in Christ, and so do you, whether you know it or not, who are parts of other houses of faith provided the first dividing line is right. Are you in Christ or not in Christ? Have you followed Jesus Christ in allowing Him to be your Lord, submitting to Him, surrendering your life to Him? Have you done that? Okay, then you're my brother, you're my sister. And the rest of it is just family squabbling. You know family squabbling. Some of you on Thursday are going to experience family squabbling. Maybe you're in the midst of family squabbling right now. Maybe it was happening in the car on the way to church this morning. You know what I'm saying. Well, in the family of God, there's some squabbling going on, right? And that's our humanness, and that's our lack of understanding fully. But God's intention is to gather us together as one so there no longer be slave, free, Jew, Gentile, male, female. Now, I'm not talking about us all becoming androgynous, but I'm talking about separation. That's not God's plan. Except, according to one, will you follow the king or will you fight against the king? Will you declare your citizenship in heaven or will you keep your citizenship here on earth? That's the choice. That's the dividing line. That's the only one that really, really matters. And that's what the servant is saying here. He has made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he's hidden me, but I'm going to be revealed. I'm going to be revealed. The Lord said, it's too small a thing that you should just save the Jews. That's not enough for you. That will be like taking Pavarotti and asking him to perform in a little south side club, right? He's bigger than that. Is he still alive? No, I didn't think so. So he's, he couldn't even show up. If he did, it would be kind of strange, wouldn't it? But you know what I'm saying, okay? It's too small a thing. No, Jesus is the light to the Gentiles. And for most of us here, I would suspect that's good news. Because I'm a Gentile. I, I'm, I'm not a child of Abraham. I can't trace my lineage through there. My lineage goes through, you know, the Celtic regions. Eventually, I could trace myself back to the same person you can, Noah. Right? We're part of Noah's family, absolutely. Adam? Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. But they were not Jews. They were not of the tribe of Judah. Okay? Not sons of Abraham. Abraham was their son. The servant is for all. God's plan in Jesus, we see it in this first part, is that he would be one despised by kings and yet worshipped by kings. And he was despised by Herod. He was despised by Pilate, though feared by Pilate too, as we know. And yet kings through the age of the church have worshipped him. 
He would be a covenant to the people to restore the earth, to release prisoners of darkness, to lead and provide for the saints and saints from everywhere. And so we come to verse 14. And it says this, But Zion said, here's the other voice in this conversation, Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Wait a minute, you chose me. You had me do all this stuff. Yeah, I wasn't exactly perfect, but you chose me, and you said you would never unchoose me, and now you're going to all the Gentiles through the servant. What's going on? Verse 15, can a woman forget her nursing child and not have compassion on the son of her womb? Surely they may forget, yet I will not forget. See, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Your sons shall make haste. Your destroyers and those who laid you waste shall go away from you. Lift up your eyes. Look around and see. All these gather together and come to you. As I live, says the Lord... You shall surely clothe yourselves with them all as an ornament and bind them on you as a bride does. For your waste and desolate places in the land of your destruction will even now be too small for the inhabitants. And those who swallowed you up will be far away. The children you will have after you have lost the others will say again in your ears, this place is too small for me. Give me a place where I may dwell. And you will say in your heart, Who's begotten these from me since I've lost my children and am desolate, a captive and wandering to and fro? Who's brought these up? There I was left alone, but these, where were they? Thus says the Lord God, behold, I will lift my hand in an oath to the nations and set up my standard for the peoples. They shall bring your sons in their arms and your daughters shall be carried on their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, queens your nursing mothers. They shall bow down to you with their faces to the earth. Lick up the dust of your feet, and then you will know that I am the Lord, for they shall not be ashamed who wait for me. Zion says, what about me? What about me? The Lord says, I'm, I'm, I'm like your mother. Even for human beings, does a mother abandon her nursing child? Now you could probably Google when you go home today and find horrible stories of young women who have abandoned their children for one reason or another. And it strikes to the heart of us. It's one of those stories we hear on the news and we go, oh, how could that happen? Because we know it's not right. And God says, you know that. How could you think that I, the Lord God Almighty, would abandon you. No, you're my child. You're my chosen one. God has not forgotten Israel. God has not abandoned Israel. God has not put the church in place of Israel. God has not said to Israel, well, psh, you tried, it gave you three strikes, you struck out, that's it. You're on the bench, forget it. None for you. No. And we of all people should be able to recognize that in that the nation of Israel exists again after centuries of various cultures and societies trying to snuff them out. Not just Nazi Germany. Nazi Germany was the most recent and perhaps one of the most horrible. But you read the history of the Jews and cultures throughout time from the time that they were separated and segregated tried to stamp them out, specifically Jews. God didn't let it happen. Of course they would think, you've forgotten us. What has God done? Where are His promises? And then suddenly, He establishes them back in the land of Palestine. And how did He do that? Did the Jews rise up and get real strong and take over and say, hey, we're taking this place? No. How did He do it? The other nations, the other nations around, established them. They said, we have to do this. This is, this is the right thing to do. And so, just as the servant said to Zion, hey, I didn't forget you, as a matter of fact, you wait, 
and you will see the very societies and cultures that sought to destroy you will carry your sons and your daughters to you. And that's exactly what's happened in the last 50 years. Exactly. And even more. And it will be so bountiful that you will say, we don't have enough room here. Go to Israel. There's not enough room there for the six million who are there and more are coming and more are coming and more are coming. There's not enough room. It's exactly as the Lord said. Israel has not been replaced by the church. And Israel today, just like yesterday and the day before and centuries before and millennia before, Jews are not saved by being Jewish. They are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ shed on the cross for their sins. The one pure, perfect sacrifice, the Passover. Just as John the Baptist said, there goes the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They looked forward to Calvary. They could not see everything. It was a mystery. The mystery of the ages that this is how God would save everybody. Through Jews? Are you kidding me? Through Jews? Stiff-necked, obstinate, don't even follow their own God? Prideful? Look at their history. That's what as a people they have been over the years. Look here. Look other places. It's been the way they have been. And God chose them to say, it isn't based upon talent. But God has given them talent so that in the centuries and centuries and centuries, do some investigation. Find who are the ones with the greatest education, who are the in a culture other than their own, who provide so much to the culture in richness, in medicine, in research, in science, and so forth. You will find more than any other ethnic group, you'll find Jews. It's God. It's God saying to us, I love you not because of you. I love you because of me. I have chosen to love you. I have chosen to take the things of this world that this world says, who has use for this? What worth is this? What worth is, are these people? What worth are these people? What worth is this person? The world says, none. The Lord God Almighty says, ha, 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 ha. you got that wrong. These are the ones I pick. These are the ones I choose. For they have chosen me. And he blesses and he restores and he takes those broken vessels and he remolds them. And the foolishness of this world of the Lord is greater than the wisdom of this world. This world's wisdom is foolishness in the eyes of God. One, one person. God's plan for us as a church is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. To not go out and make new Calvary chapelites. To go out and point people in their journey of life onto the road to salvation. The road to Jesus. That's what we're called to. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you so much for the promises of your word and the truthfulness and faithfulness of your promises. Lord, your greatest promise, the promise of a Redeemer, the one whose very name is faithful and true, our Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have made the way for us to declare citizenship in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you for that, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would make us strong in this world, declaring the righteousness of our God among the nations, among the peoples, not just within the congregation of saints, 
but to declare Your goodness and Your mercy and Your faithfulness and Your righteousness and Your love throughout this world. Helping to call others to denounce their citizenship in this world and declare their citizenship in Your kingdom. Thank You, Lord. Thank You, Lord. In this time when America sets a national holiday apart to be thankful, Lord, let us not just have an attitude of thankfulness. Let us thank the one who has given us all good gifts, the Lord God Almighty, our Creator. And let us declare that in our families, amongst our friends, in all places. And now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless you and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May He lift up His countenance upon you and be gracious unto you every day of your life through Jesus Christ who is our Lord and our Savior, and our soon-coming King. Amen and amen. God bless you.